as a network of houses for debate across Europe, we are doing debates about understanding the populist turn, we call them the ex-debates, in five countries, in Poland, in Bulgaria, in uh, Austria, here and in the United Kingdom. And it all started, of course, in 2016 uh, with the first of the series of um, political shocks that the West uh, went through and continues to be going through till now, starting with Brexit, of course, Trump, Austrian elections, populists coming uh, close to power, com coming for the first time, and parliaments in some countries coming uh, to power, actually, in coalitions in other countries. And, of course, we all felt the urge to understand what's going on, actually. But what we were very much interested in, observing the responses, the first responses to this shock um, of us, the liberals, so to say, the liberal media, analysts, etc. And what we were observing, that very often we were confronted with such narratives which talk about the supporters of populist movements in a kind of degraded way, um, with a sort of, um, um, in a way, arrogance, um, talking about that these people are, of course, uneducated, they're probably misled, they're all fake news around that actually made them vote for this and that. Um, very easily one was coming to calling them fascists or xenophobes, etc. And this made us, several of us in the Time to Talk network, feel a little bit uneasy with this because it's a sort of uh, presumes that we know all the answers, we are on the side of progress, and there are these other people that actually we have to teach. They're a little bit like school children or students who failed the exam, and now we have to give them another chance. So what is populism to begin with? Is this a useful term at all? Well, certainly, the conventional wisdom of our time is that anybody who, as the cliched phrase then goes, criticizes elites or acts up against the establishment is automatically deemed a somehow dangerous populist. The populists always immediately make it moral and personal. The problem is always that the others are simply corrupt, or to coin a phrase, crooked characters. Secondly, and maybe less obviously, populists are also going to claim that all those among the people themselves, all those citizens who do not share their ultimately symbolic construction of the supposedly real people, that with all those citizens, you can basically put their membership in the people in question. What is dangerous for democracy, and what I would say is crucial with populism, is anti-pluralism. It's the tendency always to exclude others at the level of party politics, but even more worryingly, at the level of the people themselves, citizens, where, if in doubt, already vulnerable minorities are going to get it from populists. What the hell is causing all this? Why is all this, why is all this happening? I believe that this image is deeply misleading. It suggests something like an irresistible trend, when in fact there is no irresistible trend. When people then, to kind of explain this image of the wave, go on to say, well, look, first there was Brexit, and then there was Trump, and then look at all these other actors who came very close to, uh, to, to actually winning elections. I think what they tend to forget is that neither Brexit nor Trump nor some of the further developments can really count as, so to speak, freestanding triumphs of, in this case, right-wing populists. No. Brexit didn't happen because of Nigel Farage. Brexit happened because of very established conservative politicians. We nowadays very often tend to read certain outcomes back into collective choices. What do I mean? We nowadays sometimes talk and act as if, in the case of Hungary in 2010, in the case of Poland in 2015, in the crucial elections, these populists had actually gone out there and said, hey, vote for me. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to abolish the rule of law. It's going to be great. Nobody had talked like this, okay? On the contrary, 
the relevant parties had all gone out of their way to present themselves as basically moderate conservatives. In the case of Kaczynski, where this was a little bit more difficult, you know, they went out of their way to, of course, put somebody else up for prime minister and make a point of saying, look, we just want to do nice things for families. If you have lots of kids, we're going to give you more money. But don't worry, nothing crazy is going to happen. In the case of Orban, also no talk of we're going to have a new national system, new constitution, and so on. People, in a sense, did what standard democratic theory would tell them to do, which is in a two-party system, if one party hasn't been doing well, has been discredited because of corruption as in Hungary, or is seen as too complacent as in Poland with Platforma, they just give the other guys a chance. Um, very pleased to, hear, to be here. Um, thank you for having picked a photo from 2011, which is uh, <laughs> quite nice. The problem is more probably, and I will talk a little bit about the EU, is that we didn't govern well. I mean, there is a lot of legitimized critique in the system of the European Union, and we, us, the liberal elites, were voiceless, not voicing this critique, and so we are leaving this critique. We left that critique to the populists. And I think the problem here is that they say the things that we didn't dare to say, um, to be very under complex, but what Habermas is saying in academic writings and where he gets awards for is basically what Bernd Lucke from AfD said about the Euro. But when Bernd Lucke said this in a political arena in Germany, he was a populist and when Habermas wrote this in an article, he would get an academic reward. The least you can say is that the IFD is a product of the basic bourgeois German establishment and not the product of German modernization losers or some neo-Nazis. We always had neo-Nazis in the country. They were always down to 3%. We never cared for them that much. We always had modernization losers in the former East with, you know, bringing up GDR and so on and so forth. But what made the IFD at some point in history was that the establishment decided that we need an anti-Euro party. So what I'm trying to explain to you is that this cross situation of the two populism basically makes Europe completely ungovernmental, uh, un, uh, um, un, ungovernmental because every government needs to fail. Every move that the German government will do in favor of a sort of smoother Euro politics will immediately rise the populist movement in Germany and every um, movement that the Italians or the French will do to have more more transfer union like the Germans say will obviously uh, to, to basically deserve the Italian public will will fuel the populism in Germany. And I think this is really doomed to fail because what we see is the failure of basically democratic governance in all EU member countries. And let me do, because I'm the only woman on the panel, a little feminist sort of note. Nationalism and anti-feminism are always sneaking through the same door. And I think there is a gender fight underneath this sort of nationalist populist fight and I just wanted to be as aware of this. Thank you very much. <laughs> I will also answer three questions, but let me have first two remarks to disagree with Ulrike. Uh, Poland had the best economic results, the civic platform had the best economic results in entire Europe. Um, Polish accumulated growth was almost 25% in the time of civic platform. The, the, the unemployment went from 16% to, to 8%, now it's even um, even smaller, uh, the deficit from 8 till 3. Poland was the only country without recession in Europe. And Civic Platform lost totally uh, both presidential election to nobody, actually, no one knew who is President Duda, um, and, uh, and, to, and the parliamentary election as well. Uh, so what is really interesting now is that um, Populists are, can do well also in the times of economic... Uh, uh, not, it, populism are not connected uh, to, to populist uh, uh, recession. They are doing very well also in the time of uh, economic uh, hossa. This is what you have now. Uh, openly, Viktor Orban announced March 2014 that he, finish, that he finished with liberal democracy. He announced the project of illiberal democracy. He did it openly. And then both leaders, uh, Kaczynski and, 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 and Orban, they announced illiberal counter-revolution in Europe, saying that we are relying on 100 million people joining us. So they, you, you cannot, like, it's, it's totally wrong to say that uh, people didn't vote, uh, that, that populism, it's not about illiberalism. Eastern Europe is 
even more disintegrated than Western Europe. It's not e really easy to define it in any sense. Like, uh, it's very hard to find uh, other common features than geographic. Um, I'll, I'll give you one example. Uh, even taking those, the, this two, 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 like even taking Poland and Hungary, look how different countries they are. Also, how different uh, populists are Orban and, uh, and Kaczynski. Uh, I, the, the simple way to, this, to explain what are the two politicians, what, what is defining them, is that um, I would call Orban a cynic and Kaczynski a fanatic. I think it explains pretty well what is the, uh, wh how they rule. Uh, it's like kind of a, it, it's like a difference between mafia and cloister. This is why Fidesz created oligarchy uh, uh, around the family and friends of Orban, uh, something similar to, to what you have in Russia. Kaczynski completely the opposite. Kaczynski doesn't have a family, doesn't have a friend. Uh, doesn't have a bank account, doesn't have a driving license, doesn't have, like, really, when, they, when he was asked, like, okay, what do you do at home? He says, I have a cat, and sometimes in the night I watch the Spanish rodeo on TV. And um, look, also, what's the very important difference between Hungary and Poland? I try still to answer the question of how different the countries are. Usually they are juxtaposed together. Um, Fidesz is in the center. Uh, the okay, first of all, the difference between cynic and fanatic is that cynic always at the end is pragmatic. Uh, cynic thinks about the consequences. Th cynic never commits suicide. Um, whereas fanatic don't care about consequences uh, or, or anything. He can commit suicide taking Poland with himself. This is what Kaczynski did in his career a few times. I it's just, usually I just would like to introduce the notion of the republic into the game because we know from Aristoteles that democracy is not the majority of the street and I think we are in trouble because in the let's say past 20 years of political scientists we um, used to understand democracy more as a formal procedure which is elections and as long as you win elections you are a democrat and so Erdogan, Putin, Orban, everybody learned I'm elected, I have a majority, I'm a democrat. So. The majority of the street, and that was your argument, can do very wrong things or things which are immoral. You know, I mean, I come from Germany, you could also me. If the majority of the street is the sort of a democracy, then the Nazis were probably the best democracy, Volksdemokratie, we ever had in Germany. Yeah, we do not want to pretend this. One, 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 <coughs> one uh, sentence, because, it's because if for Jan Werner Miller, freedom of speech is a part of, the, what, of what defines democracy and not liberalism, it really means that liberalism is so obvious to you that you even don't see it and you implement it a priori to the definition of democracy which exactly ex shows the difference between our political cultures. You are from the political culture where liberalism is invisible. I hope you'll forgive me if I one more time pick up our <laughs> quarrel with just one word. There was really no reason for me to be here today. A, <laughs> a fantastic uh, Polish-born social scientist once said, democracies are a system where parties lose, which is another way of saying where you can throw the bums out. The conditions of that, I still believe, are things like free assembly, free speech, a free press. Everything else you can sort of say, well, that's clearly liberal, and in that sense, yes, it can have an illiberal outcome when the, the majorities make certain, certain decisions. But if you abolish these basic rights, and then you really want to say it's still democracy, I really don't see the plausibility of that. And I don't think that our, our concepts are determined by the countries we are from, they should be determined by the strength of the arguments. But then what would be a good phrase? Because yeah, yeah, if you have a dicta dictatorship on one hand and, and a full democracy So the one on I the would other. use, I know this is not super sexy, um, but the one I would use is something like damaged democracies. 
because it kind of at least implies that somebody purposefully did the damage. It's not such, you know, people talk about backsliding or erosion. Erosion is a kind of natural process, you know, it just sort of happened. And all the people that you were kind of alluding to who tend to now say, oh, people have less and less support for democracy, I think a lot of these empirical findings are highly dubious. It kind of opens the door again to very typical 19th century, basically prejudices from mass psychology. You know, the irrational masses. You know, they bring crazies to power. Uh, let's e ideally take even more decision-making power away from them and so on. Instead of actually saying, well, look, you know why? I mean, you mentioned this very clearly. Why is Orban there? Because he's supported by a supposedly mainstream, you know, pro-European, European People's Party. So it's not, it's not necessarily at the level of all the crazy masses. A lot has to do, and now I'm going to sound like a populist maybe, with certain elite decisions. One more point and then we'll go to audience questions. Go just, ahead. Just one sentence to really underscore what Jan van Amela has said, because populism doesn't fall from the skies and it is basically a reaction to wrong policy choices of the elites and we would need to confess this. I mean, look at, uh, that's why I'm always bringing the Republic into the game, because it is basically, even in the Grundgesetz of the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, yeah, there is eine Gemeinwohlbindung uh, of every legislation process, which is that every le law of Germany should serve the public good. If you think that for, you know, for instance, in the midst of the Euro crisis, we socialized bank debt in an enormous amount, yeah? It's basically betrayal of the money of the people. It's nothing else. So it's wrong elite, elite choices in a way. And so if we were reasonable in taking the critique, you could say that the populism, even if people understand the complexity of the Euro mechanism, yes or no, but they had a sense that their, uh, the people were fooling around with their money. As in essence, yeah? So populism as a reaction to wrong elite choices and sort of the self-critique of the elites who did that, I think that really comes into, into game here and I think it should not be, it should, set, it should be said loud. Thanks for coming, thanks for coming everybody and please have a drink. <laughs>